Hello, and thank you for joining the New America Fellows Program for this discussion of The Naked Don't Fear the Water, a new book by our fellow and colleague, Matthew Akins. I'm Candice Rondeau. I'm director of the Future Frontlines Program at New America. Before we get started, I thought we could go through a little bit of housekeeping. If you guys have questions about the book or about Matthew's work, um, please do go ahead and submit them in the Q&A function, and we'll get them uh, covered in the second half of the program today. And most importantly, you can get copies of The Naked Don't Fear the Water uh, at our partner, uh, Solid State Books. You can find a link to buy the book on this page. Click just buy the book, and um, then we'll get started here. So before we do get started, before I introduce the author of our, our book uh, that we're covering today, I think I, it's important to kind of give some context here um, to really understand the, the beauty of Matthew's work, you have to appreciate the context of The Naked Don't Fear the Water and, and the writing and where it came from and why today it's so important to talk about displacement and um, all the disruption that has taken place over the last 20 years and more from the conflict, not only in Afghanistan, but in places around the world. Really, this book is about that, but it is also a story about longing. It's about loss, friendship, family. And above all, it's about the unprecedented waves of humans scattered, grinding, scattered across the world by grinding wars uh, across the Middle East, Asia, and Africa. Afghans make up a huge slice of those displaced by those wars. The UN estimates that there are about 2.6 million Afghans registered uh, around the world as refugees, and that's just the registered numbers. Um, the unofficial count must number much, much more than that. The story that Matthew has um, documented here tells part of that, um, explains exactly how that all has come together, but also um, chronicles the state of the world at war with itself, over the meaning of identity and sovereignty and borders. It's also very much a love story. Uh, as I think uh, some of you may know, uh, there was a, a review today in the New York Times of Matthew's book. Uh, and I think it really very aptly captured um, the kind of the love story uh, element of, of the book. Um, let me introduce Matthew, of course. Uh, he, for many, he needs no introduction, um, but for some who are less familiar with his work, it will be important to know that he is a uh, native of Nova Scotia. He cut his teeth as a reporter in Canada, and like me, uh, he did a stint at New York University where he earned a master's degree in Near Eastern Studies. He's a contributing writer for the New York Times Magazine and a contributing editor at Rolling Stone. His writing has earned him numerous awards, quite, quite rightly so, uh, including the George Polk Award and the Livingston Award for Young Journalists. Uh, Matthew is also a New America Fellow and a longtime colleague and a well-known fixture amongst the Foreign Correspondent Corps who has been focusing on Afghanistan for many years. The Naked Don't Fear the Water is his first book. Uh, we hope it is not his last. Um, so Matthew, thanks for joining us. Um, thanks for sharing this story, which I think is so powerful. First of all, I want to congratulate you. Uh, I know that this has been an arduous journey. And I was thinking as I was sort of paging through the narrative and, and preparing for our discussion today, the last time I saw you was probably at my place in DC. And I think you were just coming back from the tail end of your journey with your colleague uh, across Afghanistan, Turkey, Greece, and um, you weren't really sure what story you were gonna tell, but you knew you were gonna tell a story. Um, and it seemed like you had been really changed by that year that you spent with uh, your friends on the road, on living undercover, living underground, um, essentially merging with this great flow uh, from Afghanistan uh, over to, uh, to Europe. And I remember thinking that you seemed so changed and yet there was, there was something else there um, that was interesting to me because you know, you've reported on so much, uh, the, the, the civilian casualties in Kunduz, the uh, 
uh, you know, the interactions between uh, US forces in Kandahar and, and so forth. But this was different. This is a story about people that were just sort of every day in many ways. Um, can you tell me why, why then? Why did you decide you know, in 2014, 2015 that it was time to tell this story? What, what compelled you to decide, um, yeah, we got to tell the story about refugees? Well, um, first of all, just wanted to say thank you, uh, Candice, for, for hosting this. Uh, Candice is an old friend of mine. Speaking of fixtures of the Kabul journalist scene, I used to, as a young, what behind the ears freelancer, um, go and seek guidance at her place in Kabul and spent many a nice evening there. And of course, I also want to thank New America and its fellows program, um, which provided a, a wonderful home for a couple of years for me and um, my fellow fellows met a wonderful group. Uh, I particularly want to thank Peter Bergen and Avista Ayub, who, um, who heard about this project before I started on the journey, when it was kind of a secret and um, were very supportive and encouraging um, at, a, at a critical stage. And so, um, so to you know, get back to your question, I mean, I remember coming out of that, that year uh, feeling quite different um, for, for a lot of reasons. I think you know, what we had seen, the scale of, um, of suffering and, and violence and brutality you know, that you encounter um, moving through these borders was, was affecting, but that in a sense wasn't so different from covering wars in Syria and Afghanistan. I think what, what really did, did feel different um, was the degree of personal involvement that I had in this story. And I think, you know, when you are working as a reporter, you can shield yourself with a distance of objectivity um, and you, you kind of, you know, ought to in a sense uh, in order to report on something in a detached way. Um, but I didn't really have the option in this story um, as much as I might have thought I, I would or, or kidded myself that I would from the beginning, because once I entered into the migrant underground with my friend Omar, as I call him in the book, you know, it was a matter of survival. And, and, and it was also a matter of his journey, you know, reaching Europe successfully. Uh, I, I was real, you know, really going to do anything I could to help him. Um, th there was no question. So the line got crossed and it, it, it affected me more as, as a result. And, and by the end, you know, we ended up in this um, squat in Athens that was run by radical Greek no borders activists and, and volunteers. And it was a mix of families, of re refugee families and activists and, 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 and all sorts of people from all over the world living together uh, in an illegal squat. And they were totally committed to the cause. They didn't see a, um, you know, any, any kind of uh, reason why they shouldn't choose their ethics over the law or what was, you know, what, what was considered to be conventional right. And they believed in, you know, a, a more just world. They believed in a, in a revolutionary change. And I don't know if I was able to share those beliefs, but the feeling of common struggle and, and just seeing people act in a way that was ethical um, like that, that was in, a, in accordance with these deeply held beliefs. I think that shook me to the core and made me really wonder, you know, what it was that I was doing in this world. Yeah, so that's, I, I think that's one of the most striking parts. As, as somebody um, who also came up in the, the, the squatters movement myself many, many years ago, um, I, I thought it was really striking the way you connected with that community, which has been, you know, in existence for well over a century, to be honest. Uh, you know, the Black Bloc community, the anarchist community, and supporting, um, you know, the, the idea of, of community and family beyond borders has been a concept, you know, ideologically, politically, um, for, that has been around for a very long time. But to see it at work is something different. I do think it is quite transformative. But I think what's interesting um, about the book, I mean, there's so many things that we could just go on for hours that are so interesting about the book. But I mean, as you point out, you took a departure, although this is kind of, this has been your method for a while, is this sort of gonzo journalism, um, you know, but I think without the wildness and, and kind of anger and profligacy of, 
Hunter S. Thompson. It's, it's a little bit more studied and considered, but that, that's always been kind of your modus. But this is different. Uh, this story is different, in, in fact, because you do cross a line. Um, and the biggest line that you cross is the decision to go undercover as, as an Afghan, to become Habib, to inhabit um, the life of an Afghan refugee. And so by that time, obviously your diary was quite good um, and you have the, kind of the look and the feel, but you have something else that I thought was really interesting. It's just this, um, this ability to reflect on your experience as part of the, the Asian diaspora, right? Your own family um, comes from an immigrant background. Is that right? Yeah, my mother's um, grandparents emigrated from Japan at the beginning of the 20th century to California. Um, my, my, her grandfathers worked in the Sacramento Valley as farm laborers, and her grandmothers were picture brides who came over. And then, of course, um, they were all incarcerated, you know, during the war in, in internment camps. And this migrant experience is something that it's not unique, but there's something qualitatively different um, about, I think, today's conversation. One, as you point out in the book, the rising tide of anti-immigrant populism that seems to sweep over Europe as these kind of progressive waves of Syrians and Afghans uh, start pushing you know, toward Europe uh, as well as Libyans and Africans and so forth. But it, it becomes, creates this kind of upswell in reactionary forces, which is also something that you have to contend with on the road. I, I want to talk about that a little bit and, and kind of how it fits into the structure of the book, which I thought was very elegant. Um, four simple parts, the war, the road, the camp, and the city. The war is where the story really begins, but it also begins with this intriguing love story between Omar and Layla. Can you talk about that? Well, Omar was an old friend of mine in Kabul, someone I'd known almost since I got there in the end of 2008. And he was searching for love. Um, he was often entangled in one romance or another, which is not easy in a city like Kabul. Um, but he wasn't, he didn't want an arranged marriage, you know, he didn't want a traditional marriage. He had this idea, you know, of, be, of his idols like Amitabh Bachchan or, or Leonardo DiCaprio. He's very inspired by films. And so one day he, he um, his family moves to this new house, a rental house, and they're not a well-off family at all, uh, though he's worked hard in the new aid economy to make something. And then he meets the neighbor girl. The, the daughter of the, his landlord, actually, his Shia landlord, his family Sunni. He's quite a bit younger. So for a number of years, it's just a uh, casual flirtation. He can tell that she's interested, but it eventually becomes more serious. And they were kind of falling in love as things were falling apart, as you know, the Americans were leaving and violence was getting much worse in Afghanistan. And so right at the moment when this migration crisis happens and it seems, kind of seems like the door opens in Europe, for migrants, um, also Omar's application because you know he was a former interpreter with the U.S. military, so he had applied for one of these SIV immigration visas, um, but was denied because he didn't have the paperwork. So at that moment, when everything's falling apart, and, and he and I are like, "Well, we're going to go." He's falling in love, and now he realizes that maybe he doesn't want to leave without Layla because her father might marry her off to someone else. But in the end, he decides that. The only way he's going to convince the family to give their daughter to him is if he can go to Europe and like get immigration uh, status there and be able to bring her legally. So it's a love story between them, but there's also this other rich feature that I thought was fascinating. It's, it's also your love story with Afghanistan in some ways. It's got a very kind of roomy um, kind of you know, distant beloved framing that is always kind of interwoven throughout. And I think very subtly so, um, you know, you don't I, don't, I don't think you're beating us over the head, which I think is very nice, um, but it's there, it's, it's present. It's obvious that, you know, when you begin this journey and you begin trying to talk to Omar about accompanying him on his journey, uh, you're now, I guess at that point in your seventh, eighth year covering the war in Afghanistan, and then transiting to Yemen, to Libya, to uh, 
Syria. I mean, you're really in the thick of it. And there does come a time, I think, for all of us when that love of living inside of conflict and trying to convey it to the rest of the world, the, the natural rhythms of calling upon your spirit of empathy that come from covering war, there does come a time when that love seems unrequited and it's not giving it back to you, yes? Yeah, I think I think that's true. I mean, I think it's also a kind of star-crossed love because the very fact that allows you to go to this country that brought you there, um, that gives you the power to to work and report on it, which is my country's military occupation of this other poor country, um, is also what destroys ultimately the possibility of a lasting community there because the war, you know, ends so disastrously and everyone has to kind of flee for their lives. They're not killed or, or, or they end up living in a failed state. Um, so there's a fatal flaw in, in, in the structure of that love. Yes, a destined, a love destined for doom in some ways. Uh, but also interestingly capable of, I think being transformative for, for all who come into contact with it in the sense that it, it can revive your sense that um, humans are resilient, and that, that they can persevere even through the greatest trials. Uh, and I think that, you know, going now back to the, the structure of the book, again, so elegant, um, the road is kind of that beginning first step, I think for you on that, on that journey, which is moving now away from the Matthew who reported as a sort of young cub reporter and an adventurer, really, to something deeper, uh, li literally code switching and dropping your identity. Tell us about the choice you made there and why you decided that you needed to adopt that identity in order to really tell this story. Well, it was the only way that I could do it. You know, there was no other way that I could travel with Omar along the smuggler's road to Europe. Um, I would have been kidnapped or arrested and separated. So uh, there was only one way to do it. And I thought that it was an important story to tell, which is, I guess, the, the justification traditionally for undercover reporting, which involves, you know, a level of deceit. And that's, that's so that's why I did it. And, 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 and I, and I was very, conscious of the ethical uh, terrain, the difficult ethical terrain that we were setting out into, um, though I didn't quite realize how, how far in, how, how, how much I would get sucked in and, and how much I would have to kind of leave behind the, the, the objectivity of it being a journalist. Yeah, I mean, it, is, it seems like there are a lot of great tests. I mean, chief among them, the um, allowing Omar to make his own decisions yet wanting him to make a decision, <laughs> right? Yeah. Because there's a great deal of indecision, especially at the beginning. Sure. Um, and fear. I mean, you talk about how there's always a smuggler's road, right? There's always a way forward, but there's always with that well-justified terror that goes with it. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about the experience of, of encountering that terror as you entered the Moria camp? Yeah, well, it was, it was something I was always conscious of, let's say the, the difference between my own um, fear and, and, the, and that of other people around me, because as scary as a lot of the moments were, for example, crossing the, the sea in a little rubber boat, um, you have a lot more power and agency as a Western journalist, even an undercover one. So I was, I was, I was trying to observe what people around me were feeling, and, and it's really helplessness, and that's kind of the root of various forms of terror and degradation that they suffer uh, in these places. I mean, Moria was a humanitarian disaster. It was a you know, camp built for maybe a thousand people with five thousand living in it in the mud. It had burned down the week before we got there. There were fights, you know, because people had to line up for hours for food or medical supplies. It was completely dehumanizing. 
and uh, you know in a sense deliberately so because this was a deterrent meant as a deterrent to keep other migrants um, from wanting to come to Europe. Right. And that deterrent element, I think, is the, the one thing that's, you know, you, you can watch news clips about, you know, the burning of this camp uh, on BBC or CNN. And it's, you know, you maybe get a minute if you get that much time in terms of coverage, right? But I, what I thought was fascinating is that what really <laughs> was behind that event and the burning down of the camp was these internecine wars that are sparked by the inhumanity of the Europeans who are kind of creating this, this sort of fenced reality. You know, you yeah. have Africans pitted against Afghans and Syrians pitted against uh, Iranians. And then, you know, uh, and then there's this sort of interesting ranked order of like, you know, who floats to the top? Talk a little bit about that. Well, you know, there's a wonderful book by a Kurdish Iranian author, Beiruz Bouchani, um, which I quote in, in, in my book. He talks about he's he's on um, Manus prison in in the South Pacific, which is an Australian detention camp for us asylum seekers. And he talks about how you know it one of the achievements of this place is to pit ordinary human beings against each other, you know, make enemies of each other. And um, that was definitely something that that we witnessed in a variety of ways. And one of those ways is the kind of hierarchy of real refugees versus economic migrants. So the Syrians, of course, were the most, um, you know, welcome of, of, of any of the migrants. They got preferential treatment from the asylum authorities, but also, you know, what the NGOs and stuff like that. There's a sense that if anyone ought to be here, it's maybe the Syrians. And then, you know, you had the Iraqis, the Afghans at the time, you know, Afghans were seen kind of as um, second rate refugees, right, because they're, they had a democratic government that was supported by the West. So, so why should they be fleeing? And then further on, you had people who were considered economic migrants, people like Pakistanis and Moroccans who could be deported. Um, and they had very little hope of getting asylum, of, of moving onward though we'd all arrived in the same boats. And that created divisions between the, uh, the inmates. They, they began to internalize these hierarchies and you often saw them using, you know, having contempt for, maybe the Syrians would have contempt for Moroccans or the, why are you here and clogging up the system? Um, so they're replicating in many ways, the hierarchy of, of, the, of, of white Europe, you know, for categorizing these migrants. And that also seems to play out. I mean, what's interesting also is that that, sort of hierarchy of white Europe seems to also just trickle down right down to the ground level where you have Turkish policemen, you know, um, whipping people who, who's, you know, no Pakistani, no Pakistani. Mm -hmm. It's quite remarkable, like the, yeah. the kind of the kind of osmosis that seems to occur uh, in terms of like that inculcation around that white European hierarchy and how pervasive it is. And it turns Turkey into this very strange um, kind of middle passage state. Uh, it, it almost reminds me of, you know, the slave trade, uh, you know, back in the early 1700s, early 1800s, before of course the abolition, uh, abolition in the UK and then ultimately our civil war uh, in the United States over slavery. But there, you know, there's a lot of work done around the middle passage, the landings and in the Caribbean, Mm -hmm. um, and kind of this strange kind of uh, scenario in which the re you know, there's this recreation of the hierarchies, um, and those those states take on this kind of uh, almost police like role. Yeah. And there's no. It seems like also there's no. Um, Effectively, there's no real internal critique in, in Turkey. Well, whereas in Greece, you, you, I felt a sense of sort of contrast in terms of the reaction from the public. I mean, on the one hand, you had the anti-immigrant uh, feeling, but on the other, you had a sort of mobilization because actually Greece had gone through a lot economically itself, right? I mean, it was already in the throes of uh, a pretty serious economic downturn. That solidarity, I think, is an interesting piece um, that 
bubbles up in the third section, right? Um, where you move from the camp uh, and then finally to the city, which is the final section of the book. Talk a little bit about the decision that you made to allow, again, once again, Omar found himself banging his, banging his head against the wall. I mean, there's so many moments of defeat, right? Um, and he's not the only one. Everybody is just, you know, playing the game, as you say, right? And everybody's watching the game unfold. Talk about the game. What is the game? The game is a term that Afghans use. It's, they use the English world, uh, word, and, but it refers to the whole, let's say, um, strategizing and, and, and the, the various you know, routes or ways that you might use to get through the border. So, you know, like if you got a game, if you're thinking about game, it's it's maybe you're trying the trucks, maybe you're going to sneak on board the ferry, maybe you got a fake passport. You know, it's it's um, it's the focus basically of, of 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 their of their days because you're just trying to move onward until you do. Your life is on hold, right? So that's the game and. We learned that there's a million ways the game can be played. The, the human ingenuity is remarkable. They're always circumventing new border um, strategies and new border strategies are being implemented. This is kind of dialectic, but, um, but on the micro level, it's very interesting how that becomes part of people's culture, part of people's language, part of people's day-to-day -day consciousness. Yeah, um, and the smugglers are such a huge part of the game. Uh, and I wonder you know, if there were things that in your year long journey um, that surprised you about the interaction with the smugglers and, and, and their role in the entire game? Well, I think that, you know, the smugglers are demonized as being responsible for the migrant crisis uh, as being, I think, you know, Matteo Renzi, the Italian prime minister called them the slave traders of the 21st century. And that's nonsense. I mean, borders and smugglers exist in a kind of um, a dialectic. Again, you, you, you know, you would, without border measures, you wouldn't have smugglers. The more border policies you have, the more cops you have on the border, the more incentive there is for migrants to pay smugglers, the more of a smuggling economy it creates, the more concentrated these smuggling groups get. This is all very well documented. So it's, 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 um, it's a form of hypocrisy uh, to just try to paint the problem as being these criminals, these smugglers. And, but nevertheless, you begin to think that they must be monstrous people, perhaps, if you, if you read about these instances where they're shoved, people are shoved into containers and suffocate. When the truth is smugglers are a part of society, especially in a place like Afghanistan, where for 40 years now, people have been having to flee across borders because of war. And while a lot of them are very unsavory characters, they're also, um, you know, acting in their own interests, they're businessmen, in some case women, and if you can find a good one, uh, that's great. But every migrant, every refugee who escapes basically needs a smuggler because their movement is criminalized. You know, Afghans aren't allowed to cross any borders, basically. Uh, they're without, without visas, and visas are almost impossible to get. So smugglers are, um, are very much part of the system, and uh, they're someone that you have to deal with. And we dealt with them, and we had mixed experiences. But um, but these journeys aren't possible without smugglers. Yeah, he certainly had very mixed experiences, and and so did so many others. And it's very striking how um, the the kind of the economies, uh, the little mini economies that are built up around small transactions like you know getting fake IDs and okay. uh, entering into a hotel without ID uh, so that you can register right and stay in a hotel and get a hot shower, you know, clean bed, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, I know our audience is going to have a lot of questions, so I just want to remind you all, folks, to, um, if you do have questions, drop it into the Q&A. We're going to get to those in the next few minutes here, but I, I do want to turn to that, that piece about um, the economy, the political economy of this, of this massive transit, what you call the border industrial complex that yeah. supplies ships and surveillance drones and biometrics. Um, to Middle Eastern and African migrants uh, who are fleeing to Europe. And I had the sense when I was reading this that this was kind of a discovery for you, that perhaps the dimensions of that, um, that the massive sort of oppressiveness, the sprawl of that border industrial complex 
was something that actually had maybe been an abstraction until you started out on the road. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I think we're in danger of replicating the same um, mistake that we've made with the war on drugs, you know, creating this um, violent, repressive apparatus that actually encourages the very, you know, illegal economy it's meant to co combat. So th this, just like all the drug uh, anti-narcotics efforts in, in Latin America, for example, have just led to larger and, and more complex and violent um, cartel economies. So too, are we going to see the same thing with smugglers in the borders of Europe? And um, of course, people are profiting off this arms companies, the same companies that have you know, been involved in the war on terror or selling drones and biometric surveillance tools to border guards. Um, and the people who really suffer are, are migrants who uh, are forced to cross increasingly violent um, borders. So it's, it's, it's a little horrifying what's happening, uh, the way that, that Europe's and, and many other borders in the world are becoming militarized um, and that, that, and, and um, the way that invasive forms of surveillance are that begin at the border are creeping into our societies as a whole, just to stop people, you know, who are, who are fleeing poverty and war. Yeah, I mean, I think what's fascinating is, I mean, that's a great comparison with the war on drugs, actually, because we now see, let's just take the United States, right? Like the, the kind of the move from these very harsh criminal justice punishments around, you know, possession uh, or, or even uh, distribution of, of drugs for small time, uh, you know, offenses and how there's been a reassessment of the criminalization of the human being uh, who is kind of forced into these political economies that are really rooted in white supremacy um, and really rooted in this idea of you know, a human hierarchy. Very similarly, right, with this idea that um, you know, there are, that Syrians somehow versus Afghans versus Pakistanis um, somehow have more right to ask the world for help, um, depending on what Western European capitals say, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, one could argue that if Angela Merkel hadn't, uh, you know, very openly stated that she was pressing for Germany to welcome uh, Syrian refugees in particular, that we would have a completely different set of hierarchies today. Um, and as you pointed out, uh, Washington never did that for Afghans, despite the fact, um, you know, it kind of, Washington persisted with this fiction that its actions in Afghanistan were not harmful, uh, that in fact, were, you know, that there was a stabilizing force. And to some extent there was and there wasn't, right? I mean, uh, clearly not stabilizing enough to prevent, you know, the migration of millions of Afghans from the country. Um, it's, it's those dichotomies that I think also, um, are poorly addressed in the policy community today. You know, we don't, we, while we have this constituency around um, correcting the errors of the war, on, uh, the war on drugs, we don't have that constituency when it comes to the war on, on human beings who are uh, migrants because of conflict, because of uh, economic displacement um, that grows directly out of policies adopted by Western capitals. What would be the way, I mean, from, from your perspective, now that you've kind of been through this, um, if you were going to talk to, you know, the policymaking community or the advocacy community, what would you tell them would be important for them to focus on to change the frame? Well, I think in the case of Afghanistan, we, in a sense, owe reparations to the Afghan people for the disaster um, that we've caused there and what's happening now in the country our tools for helping Afghans inside the country are, are, are a bit constrained um, because of the, the Taliban government that's in place. But, you know, we seem to be um, failing even limited things that we could do in terms of, uh, you know, helping the financial system get started again. But Afghans outside the country, certainly we, we have a better ability to help. And so we don't forget most of them are in Iran and Pakistan. So they, those governments should be encouraged to give them 
you know, economic rights and, 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 and they should be funded to help, you know, um, alleviate the burden of, of these large refugee flows. And Afghans should be allowed to move, allowed to settle. We should, we should allow Afghans to help themselves because don't forget remittances contribute three times as much to the developing world um, as foreign aid. You know, remittances are money that people send home to their families. So just allow Afghans to move freely, you know, stop, stop criminalizing their movement, give them visas. Um, as a form of reparation for, for the harm that we've caused our country. Uh, that will be good for them and it'll be good for us as well. I mean, I think there's a lot of evidence that immigrants and refugees contribute to the societies that they settle in, particularly when they're given economic rights and mobility to allow them to rebuild their lives. Yeah, in a way, it's almost more costly to throw up these fences. And I think that that's a, actually a very apt way of framing um, you know, the challenge, particularly with Afghanistan. Um, reparations is, of course, a, such a sensitive word in the United States, as you know, a very loaded phrase. Um, and a lot of folks don't like that idea uh, because what they hear is money in dollars, right? And they hear, um, you know, money coming out of taxpayer accounts and, you know, misdirection of the state resources and so forth. But, you know, reparations can have all kinds of shapes. And I do think, um, you know, access to, uh, you know, simply get across a border without being molested, without having to sell your body, uh, as in the case of some of the people that you document, without having to sell your soul along the way. Um, I, I think that is a key part of reparations that we kind of underestimate the value of it. Um, and, and actually maybe relatively a discount cost when you really think about it, uh, just the simple right of movement and how much that would change for people if they didn't have to negotiate uh, those borders um, and those dangers in the way that they are forced to do so today. So I want to get to some questions here. We have a few, um, and, I, and, and some of them are, are ones that I would actually ask. Um, I mean, you talk a little bit about your process in the book in terms of taking notes and documenting everything you're docu documenting, and also sort of giving um, anonymity to some of the people that you encounter. But I know, uh, for me, probably for other readers and, and folks who are interested in your process, how did you get all this down? I mean, without people kind of like going crazy looking at what you were doing. It was actually easier than I thought it would be. I had a burner smartphone that I brought on the trip with me and everyone was had their own smartphones and they were busy tapping away on Facebook or WhatsApp. So it wasn't very remarkable for me to be sitting in a corner writing down my notes. So I would take down the notes whenever I could, um, certainly every day. And then when I accumulated them, I would, uh, and got access to the internet, I would email them to a kind of, you know, relay account and then delete them from the phone. And in that manner, I, I accumulated 60,000 words of notes over the course of, you know, a few months. So now I can imagine I mean, that part I, I kind of understood, but I can imagine you get 60,000 <laughs> words uh, of notes and then you come back at some point and you've got to make sense of it. What, was that difficult? Did you find, did you have a system for that? I think what helped a lot was that you had a journey with the beginning, middle and end. So that was a, that was a godsend for the structure of the, your first book. So in that sense, the action itself, um, it was more a matter of, you know, deciding what to include, what not to include. What was harder for me to make sense of, I think, are the bigger questions, um, both about the systems that were moving through, like the border industrial complex that just required a lot of research because it was a fairly new area for me. Um, but also trying to, you know, as you touched on earlier, structure a kind of um, moral narrative, uh, you know, create create a poetic uh, language that could express certain things that otherwise are very difficult to express. Love is probably one of the hardest things to talk about, right? So all that took a lot of time. I mean, it took me um, four years of writing. I would love to know more about that, actually. Um, I mean, for me, you know, I'm kind of a, I'm a notorious information journalist, right? Um, I don't always write with the greatest feeling, but I, I love to pursue, you know, the dark hidden corners. Um, but it takes a lot of courage to embrace um, the emotion, I think, and, and let it out on the page um, and sort of sit with it for a while. What, what books or what things sort of inspired you as you were kind of 
um, pacing through that process that made you kind of more able or sort of strengthen your ability to, to let your heart out on the page? Well, I read a lot of, um, I read a lot of kind of classic stuff like, uh, you know, Emile Zola, um, Jeremy Nell, for example, or, or Steinbeck is in there. Um, I read Orwell and, uh, you know, that was, I think that was kind of more on the, on the register of trying to capture these great social forces that were in play. In terms of, of personal writing, I mean, that was, I was reading a lot of poetry. I was reading a lot of Persian poetry, classic stuff like Rumi, um, Faiz, Ahmad Faiz, you know, that was ultimately what made it e easier for me to try to express emotion was, was poetry. Yeah, that really comes through. I mean, also the, the kind of, the passionate love affair with Kabul itself um, certainly comes through. And Kalai Fatullah and, you know, the kind of, the corners of Shari now that are now so distant and so I think transformed uh, by many years of war, but also the exit of so many, not just Americans, not just Europeans, but obviously the exit of so many Afghans. Do you reflect on that now? What, what Kabul might look like maybe five years from now as this exodus continues? Definitely, you know, it, it, when this, I finished the book, more or less um, at the beginning of, of last summer. And I went back to Kabul and I was there throughout the summer and stayed throughout the evacuation in the fall to, to report and witness a new wave of Afghans escaping, a new wave of displaced. Uh, I was in Nimroz actually in the fall and I went down there um, with sometimes colleagues and we went to some of the same places that I had been with Omar, you know, five years earlier uh, and it really has created an, an, another layer I think of poignancy for me um, I was rereading the book and there's this there's a scene where Omar goes he's been living you know growing up in exile as a kid in Iran and Pakistan and his family um, and you know it's October 2001 or, or sorry it's it's beginning of 2002 yeah, but it's after you know the U.S. invasion and this bright new era. Hamid Karzai is on the radio, promising you know peace and democracy, and they're they're among the millions of Afghans who decide to go home. You know they want to rebuild their country, and he gets to the border and he sees that the white flag of the Taliban has been replaced by the tricolor, you know, of the king's time, and he feels you know this pride and hope, and so now obviously thinking about this summer when I saw that white banner flying again above Kabul. Um, it just, it just it feels like this cycle has come around um, and it's so tragic. And there are those cycles. I mean, I, I also think that what's interesting is that you, every single family member uh, that Omar has, has had, has been part of that cycle. His parents were part of the cycle. Mm -hmm. He's part of the cycle. His siblings are part of the cycle. And every in all the Afghans he encounters, and there's kind of this ebb and flow um, that you know now we're entering year 42 of this war, roughly. Uh, people don't think of it that way. They kind of tend to think of it as the American War or the Soviet War, but it actually is the Afghan War. Mm -hmm. um, so many cycles embedded in it. What hope can we have then, given given that cycle, that we can break from it. What, 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 is, what is the path to breaking from that cycle? Hard question. Yeah, I mean, I, I wish I knew. I, I think the hope that we can have is in the resilience of Afghans over that 40 year cycle, you know, of, of, of um, displacement, exile, return. Um, they've created a transnational community, really. You know, it's not just people are, are moving back and forth. Um, often the first thing Afghans want to do once they get settled and, you know, as refugees or immigrants in the West is go back to Afghanistan and see their family for a wedding or whatever. And in a, in a sense, that's, that is the, that is a solution for, for, you know, to, to some aspect to alleviate some aspects of the conflict is to have, allow people to move. And again, that's why I think it's really important that we not, you know, pr 
criminalize Afghan movement across borders. They have the worst passport in the world when it comes to visa fee travel. You know, these, the, the visa system, um, the sanction system against airlines to prevent them from, you know, bringing anyone without a visa, a proper visa, uh, that's designed to explicitly keep out refugees. It has its historical antecedent in measures designed to keep Jews out, um, you know, during um, the Nazi period. So we should, uh, we should see how Afghans have built a transnational community um, in the last 40 years. And we should support that and see that as an inspiration to, um, and, and a part, partial solution to an intractable conflict. Right, so this brings us to a question that's coming from a, uh, one of our, our audience members, which is sort of, you know, we've touched on this a little bit already, um, but Gio asks what changes or, you know, political or policy changes do you hope the book prompts and at what level? I mean, I, that's a very broad question. I would just say also, mm. you know, think about some of these lily pad countries, uh, so to speak, right? Rwanda, Uganda, where Afghans now who've recently been exiled. Um, maybe is there a message for those governments? Is there a message for the United States government where the lily pad countries are concerned? Yeah, I hope that you know people will um, have a better sense of of the the integrated transnational systems that exist, both in terms of how people migrate and also how the West is trying to keep migrants out um, by encouraging the lily pad states, the transitional countries like Turkey, to incarcerate migrants to, to to deport them to build walls. So if we can stop doing that, if we can if we can stop hindering, you know, um, if migrants if we can instead encourage countries. Um, to treat Afghan refugees with dignity. Um, and one way to do that is to do more resettlement so that, you know, people are more likely to accept refugee flows if they think, you know, countries that are, are, are less able to host them because they're not rich countries are more likely to, to host them temporarily if they think that these pe that people are going to get a chance to move on and be resettled in the West. So I would say that... Um, that those are, but it wasn't really a book that was written with a lot of policy in mind. And I think one of the things that, you know, the book comes up against is just how big these problems are. Like a mass migration is not going to stop as long as we have a world that's divided between rich and poor in such a brutal way, right? And I don't think um, our governments are interested in, in solving those problems. And, and in some sense, maybe the solution has to lie outside of them. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, I mean, it, it, and that's right. I mean, I think the beauty of the book is that it's not a policy book. I mean, it's a critique. Uh, clearly of the policies that have been adopted, the, the you know, border industrial complex, but there's, there's much more to it than that. And I think that's right. It's um, sometimes when writing about Afghanistan or writing about kind of the, the challenges that come from conflict in general, there's a great temptation to say, I have the solution or there is, you know, there is a path forward, but there oftentimes isn't. Uh, and it kind of can offer, I think, a, a false sense of hope uh, that, uh, you know, there's a turnkey solution and a, and a linear set of steps that you can take um, to providing some sort of uh, solution to the problem. But I, I want to go back to your, your point about dignity. Mm. Um, I think one of the things that's underappreciated about what it is, what it means to report from a conflict zone uh, is the question of dignity and how actually the core of war is really very much about squeezing dignity out of people, preventing them from even thinking that they should entertain the idea that they deserve dignity. And I wonder, I don't know, I'll let this be sort of one of the last questions that we kind of entertain. If you could talk a little bit about the, the little tiny humiliations, I think you sort of reference, um, and how you saw people trying to recover their dignity, even at times when it just seemed impossible on the road or in the camps. Yeah, I think that the asylum process, the the um, is 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 very uh, dehumanizing. It, it robs people of dignity the way they have to kind of present their suffering and their um, their worth their moral worth as, as a real refugee and not an economic migrant. It creates an incentive for people to lie, frankly, because only the most, you know, and especially when it comes to resettlement where people are kind of competing for a limited number of slots to, to, to get resettled from Turkey to the West, for example. And I write about this in a chapter of the book. 
um, you know, only the, the worst cases and, and then the people who suffer the most will get considered. Um, so it, it is, it is, uh, it is dehumanizing the, the 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 language of around asylum. Um, another another interesting shift is it's shifted from a kind of right, which is it is under the 1951 Geneva Convention for people who signed it, uh, into a kind of privilege and just a kind of humanitarian uh, gift that is given to people who we've who we've kept, we've dammed up and we've walled them away in places like Turkey to prevent them from reaching the West, and then they get to apply and you know hopefully be resettled. And I think one of the things, you know, the practical steps that can be done, we actually saw it happen with, with the evacuation, you know, we just brought people over humanitarian parole, like, you know, get them into the country, they're here, we, you know, we both have colleagues who in those, in those first few days, um, instead of being stranded in Mexico or, or Uganda or whatever, got to come to the US. Um, because there was so much political pressure and they're now living lives with much more dignity because they've arrived here and they can begin to start. But that, that tap has already been turned off. The administration's already, you know, put a stranglehold on, on, on um, those kinds of exceptional uh, immigration procedures. And so people are once again in limbo, which is a situation that would rob uh, anyone of dignity. Yeah, that powerlessness and, and that being robbed of dignity piece is so pervasive throughout the book. I just want to say, you know, uh, I read a lot of books, okay, uh, but but very, very rarely do I get through a book and have to like mark up every single page just for the just the pure beauty of it. Um, and, and I think one of the things that struck me, uh, you know, everybody who writes about Afghanistan knows that it's a place of poetry and proverbs. Uh, and, and a big question I'm sure a lot of readers have is, what is this proverb, the, the naked don't fear the water? What, what is that referring to? And um, why did you pick that title? Um, well, it's, it's, a, it's a Persian proverb, a diary proverb, actually, luch as ob namitarsad, which means the naked don't fear the water. And it's essentially, if you have nothing to lose, then you have nothing to fear. And yet, <laughs> and yet there is so much fear, so much fear on the road. Uh, Matthew, let's, you know, before we close out here, I know a lot of people are going to wonder, what's your next, what's your next thing? <laughs> and I think it's probably a pretty hard question to answer. I mean, I know your next thing is getting out there and talking about the book um, and, and hopefully, you know, meeting with some of the folks that uh, are taking an interest in some of the policy things mm -hmm. that, uh, that you, you raise in the, in the book. But for you now, I mean, you've been reporting for almost 15 years uh, on the war, the, the wars around the world, right? Um, and I wonder, you know, <laughs> what your next act will be, what, what you're thinking about. I know that's a hard question, but maybe you can give a, a reader or two uh, a hint on chapter, ne the next chapter in your journey. I don't know, I, actually, I feel very much like I, it could be anything, like I'm, I'm, uncertain about what to do next, uh, where to go, except that, you know, I think right now there is a very uh, urgent task, which is keeping the focus on Afghanistan. And, and the next thing I'm going to do is go back to Afghanistan to see, to see people there, to, to write about it, to do what I can to help, because I think there's going to be a very strong temptation to turn our backs on the country that there's no American soldiers there. And we can't allow that to happen. No, we certainly can't. I don't want to give a spoiler, but I'll just ask you. Um, how are things with the, with the many folks that you know now who have been uh, forced into exile? What are you hearing? Well, I think that the lucky ones who have made it to the West, it's actually a much more welcoming climate than than it has been in the past because of what happened with the Taliban takeover. Um, as for, for Omar and his family, I can say that they're, they're doing well and I'm, I'm in contact with them all the time. That's a big deal. Well, listen, I think um, we are coming to a point where uh, we have covered so much ground and um, there's so much more to say about this book, but I'd rather have people just go out there and get it and read it. I'm just holding it up one more time. And I swear to God, I'm not a shill. Um, it is one of the best books I've read this year. Uh, I would be shocked if it didn't win numerous awards uh, in the coming year. And Matthew, I wanna wish you the best on your journey. 
um, wherever it takes you next in terms of um, what you want to explore, but more importantly, just kind of finding your way back to yourself and, um, and your continued coverage of this most important topic, this most important issue of the so many who are displa displaced around the world by, by conflict. I wanna thank you for your contribution uh, to that history. And most importantly, um, thank you for your courage as well. Thank you, and, and thank you to New America, um, a wonderful community that I'm glad to be a part of. Excellent.